consider, let's consider a pair of subspaces in one, in two, in three. So if you have a vector space and inside it you have a pair of subspaces, can be a Describe all such configuration. For example, is it true that it's completely determined just by dimension of that, of V, and dimension of these subspaces? Okay. On the, the, because of the fundamental theorem of linear maps, if we know that they're direct sum? Yeah, but we don't. Okay, so more general case. Yeah, we don't know that it's direct sum. I'm saying just a pair of subspaces in. So is it true that we can always, uh, that if we know the dimension of each of these spaces, that we can always choose a basis such that any such configuration, all such configuration look the same, such like this picture? Yeah? Of course. Uh, what do you mean classified? Okay. Uh, <coughs> so uh, there are several ways to do that. Let me at the moment say the following. You can think of you can, instead of saying that this is a subspace here, let me slightly rephrase it, you can think of it that you have vector space V1 and map from it into V, which is injectable. You have vector space V2, actually you know what, let me draw it here. And you have a map here, I2. So the whole picture, if I choose a basis here, basis here, and basis here, the whole picture is described by a pair of matrices. This is a matrix, an injective matrix, so it is well, whatever it means in terms of rows and columns. And that's an injective matrix, meaning again that whatever it means. So is it true that if you have two such configurations, such that all dimensions are the same, you can you can make you can choose a basis here and basis here such that uh, this method, so, so is it true that if you have any two such configurations with same dimensions, that you can always choose a basis, basis in them so that I1 and I1 prime are given by the same matrix. So it's like a question of classifying linear operators up to change of basis, except that here we are changing the basis in here, in, in sense, except that here we have three vector spaces, and two matrices between them. So and we classify such data up to changing the basis in each of in each of these vector spaces. So, so if you have chosen a basis in V1 and V and in V2, you have two matrices. If you change a basis, well this matrix is transformed in a rather obvious way. So is it true that up to this change of basis, or any such mat uh, matrices will always be made to look the same. That was the statement here. Up the choice of basis, so your matrix should look like, uh, so here the matrix, if it would look like this, you have one, 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 and then possibly some number of zeros, just a second, it needs to be injective, so number, and then you will have zeros so the matrix describing this map is written here. So the statement was that by choosing, in this situation, by choosing the basis in V1 and VB, you can make your matrix look like this. Question, is it true that you can do the same in, in uh, a pair of subspaces, or any such, give, if once you fix the dimension, then the rest is completely determined? Yeah. The dimension is yeah, the answer is it's not true. You actually you have another invariant, namely dimension of the intersection, which is rather obvious. Um, but rather than say that this is completely defined by three numbers, let me just put in. Let me make a slightly different form of the answer. The statement is that here, again, let me make it picture because I like pictures. Before, were there supposed to be six ones? Uh, six ones were or six for the matrix, because um, in the picture you drew above there was only four dots in V one. Okay, so the number, so this should correspond to the number of columns of your matrix. This should correspond to the number of rows of your matrix. Okay, so matrix from k-dimensional space to 
to L-dimensional spaces, a matrix with L rows and K columns. And if I did it, if I did not count correctly, well, okay, uh, you'll have to fix that. So the statement is that any configuration will look like this. So you have some, you have some number of basis elements here, and of course, if I just look. <coughs> So you have some number of basis elements here. So that's a typical configuration you have. I think so that so what does it describe? So you have some so you have a basis in here. This part of it is a basis in the intersection. This part of it this plus these pieces is basis in V1, this plus this is a basis in V2, and the rest doesn't belong to either. So rather than trying to describe this in terms of basis, let me make the following statement, that any configuration like this, uh, again, by configuration, I mean pair of vector spaces embedded into the third one, it can be built out of blocks of, in this case, of the following three times. This is one block where you have one vec basis element here, one basis element here, which are sent to each other and nothing here. That's another type of block. <coughs> and so that's the third one. And that's the fourth one. So in other words, there are four basic Situations and the rest you can get them there from them by just well uh, by taking direct sum. So basic situation is that that I'm, for simplicity I'll use vector spaces over C. So this picture where we have a basis element here, which is sent to basis element here, <coughs> nothing here. If you look at the vector spaces generated by this basis element, you have this configuration. So this basis element here, basis element here, and basis element here, all corresponding to each other, correspond to this. And you can guess what are the others. And here you have. <coughs> so instead of talking in the language of basis, I would prefer to talk in the following uh, language. I would say that any configuration like this, first of all, if I have, so I have the operation of direct sum on such configuration. So if a vector space with two subspaces and another vector space with two subspaces, I can take direct sum here, here, and here. So I expect that you know the notion of direct sum of two vector spaces. Now. That's do we need to say more about that? Okay. So then I'm saying that anything, any configuration of two vector spaces in the third one can be obtained by taking direct sum of these simple blocks. Uh, sorry. Okay. And similarly, here you have just two possible blocks. C and zero is corresponding. That's one of them. That's another. Okay. But so the answer is that there are four basic blocks, and anything is obtained by combination of them, which in particular means that they, once I fix the dimension, there are only finite many possibilities. Subspaces. Oh. So far, we didn't really need any any special information, any special tools. If you know a little bit about basis, then the statement that anything you can always find a basis such as I draw is easy to prove. If you start about three subspaces, let me again. 
make a picture. One, two, and three. Yeah. All inside. What's the answer there? Eight bars. Hmm? Eight bar. Okay. That's so first of all, the moment you start thinking about that, you will see that it doesn't really so first observation is that it's no longer possible to really describe in terms of the basis. That is to say you don't always you can it's not true that you can choose a basis here, 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 and here, that all your embeddings are just sent basis vectors to basis vectors. That's just not true. So you really need to forget about bases and talk about linear operators or matrices. Simplest example when it is not true is when you have this configuration. <coughs> but um, uh, they are sent, so so well I'll make a picture. So this is my whole V, which is two-dimensional. Obviously, my picture is in the real, uh, in, in, in over the real number. So that's two-dimensional real space. I cannot draw a two-dimensional complex space. But that's enough to give you an idea. So that's my subspace V1. That's my subspace V2. And that's my subspace V3. Here we have a picture of three subspaces. But you cannot choose a basis in here which puts such that some subset of it is basis in V1, another subset is basis in V2, and the third subset is basis in V3. You just can't. <laughs> you don't have an option of choosing three basis vectors in three-dimensional space. Uh, so basis is really not the right way uh, to describe things. So you might ask, what are the possible building blocks here? Again, what do I mean by building blocks? Well, to be precise, what I would mean is, is it possible to, to find some finite collection of such configurations such that everything else can be obtained from them by taking direct sums? So that would obviously be one of the building blocks. Uh, it's not very difficult to try and guess some others. For example, you obviously also have building blocks which look like this. That's kind of obvious situation. And you have a couple of other equally obvious ones. For example, you have C, 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 C. And then, of course, you can rotate that. So here I had V1 and V2 being one-dimensional, V being one-dimensional, and V3 being zero-dimensional. But I could, I could rotate the picture, so I could have these two be one-dimensional and these be zero-dimensional. So out of this, using these three using these pictures, I, each of them actually encodes not a single block but three different blocks. So how many of the blocks we have so far? We have one block like this. We have three, so two, three, four here. We have three here. Anything else I missed? All zero. Yeah, well, all zeros is kind of trivial. Uh, it's a zero object. If you take direct sum of it with anything else, you are not changing that. Are three. So you can have this one. That would be eight. All C. Hmm? You can take all C. All C is here. Oh, all C of course. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't write that. I thought I did. OK. Anything else that comes to mind? Uh, no, I mean typically I use this symbol to include to indicate that it's an injection, so that's uh, injective map. 
But since, but I might as well make my life easier and just write all arrows as usual arrows and the, the information that this is all embedded, so that's all injective maps, I just say in words. So the answer is, it turns out that that's the full list, which is not really obvious. You start thinking about that, and it takes a little bit skill to explain why this is the full list, why anything, any configuration of three subspaces in a third space can be obtained. You can split it into direct sum of blocks like of one of these nine types. Uh, it takes a little bit time to, to do and some skill, but it's not impossible without having any tools whatsoever, just by brute force. So if you are if you are good in manipulating linear maps, you can do that. Yes. Why is the first one different from the ninth one? Because that's C two. Okay. That's two dimensional space, and the picture where it was like this. Any two of them generated, but all three of them become linearly dependent here. So that's really different from this. And it's notice that this one is not the same as if I took this direct sum with this. Because here, if I took direct sum of these two, of course the dimension would be the same. But the structure would be different. Because in this direct sum, uh, the images of all of them, if you take the image, if you take the subspace in C which is spanned by images of these three, it will be one, one dimension. In this picture, if you take the red sum, if you take the subspace spanned by images of these three, it is two dimension. So this is not the same as this plus this, even though the dimensions are the same. It's a good point, but um, yeah, but it's also I just made it too small enough. So the claim is that it's a full list. Okay. Uh, why is that the only one with that's two dimensional? Uh, you can try and see what other options you have. So I claim that if you if you insist on this being two dimensional and each of these being one dimensional, then we don't really have, the only options you have then is either this or some direct sums here. For example, if if these two are mapped into the same one-dimensional subspace here, then that would give you this picture plus uh, plus which of them plus this one. Yeah, uh, this might be a stupid question, but there is no such thing as stupid questions. So go ahead. If we why aren't there any maps from like like on for number nine you have C to C to C to C? Mm -hmm. Why aren't there any that are all C two? Okay, that's not clear. But I claim that there are none. It's not clear at all why. But I claim that if you have any configuration uh, with say C two, well, first of all, here I didn't need to say anything else. What exactly these maps are? As long as I say that they are not zero, that's enough. If you talk about C2, and here is C2, and here is C2. If you think about configuration like this, then you really need to say more. What is this map? What is this map? What is this map? So if they, well, actually you don't really have much choice. If this is injective, if you want it to be subspace, then this needs to be just equal to this one. And this needs to be equal to this one, and this needs to be equal to this one. But in this case, that's just direct sum of two copies of this picture. So that's not an elementary block. That's you can split it firmer as direct sum of this. However, this one you cannot split as direct sum. 
By the way, I should get my terminology straight. I was talking about these blocks using the words such as simple or elementary. Um, both of them are somewhat misleading. So what I really want is, when I say block, I mean something which cannot be further written as direct sum of two smaller pieces. Proper terminology for this is in decomposable. So not simple. Simple is typically used for something else. So let me call it by its proper name and say it's indecomposable if it cannot be split into direct sum. Okay. Uh, but the good part is that here we again have finitely many possibilities. So you might ask, uh, is it always true? Is it true? For example, since there are only finitely many blocks possible or in decomposable configurations, it's easy enough to explain that for any choice of dimensions of the three spaces, you only have finitely many possible configurations up to this change of basis. Uh, you might wonder if it is almost true. It's remarkable that these simple questions didn't really get studied much until very late. I think, well, this particular question of subspaces I think, well, for three subspaces it was, of course, no long ago, but in full generality, I think it was only answered in 1970s after the work of Gabriel and then um, Bernstein, Gelfand, and Bonamara. Okay? You can guess what would be my next picture. Subspaces in C2. Again, I cannot make picture of one dimensional sub uh, C2 and one dimensional subspaces, but can, I can make picture of. So we have in, in the real world, so I can have a picture where we have four lines. Is it true that by changing the basis in my two-dimensional space, I can always make any such configuration of four subspaces look like any other? And the answer is no. And if you have studied complex analysis, then you should recognize why it is impossible. Because you can always make a change of basis. Well, first of all, I can make a change of basis such that V1 becomes a first coordinate basis. After that, I can take the, well, assuming that they are all, let me assume that no two of them coincide. If some of them coincide, that's easy to do. Let's assume that no two of them coincide. <coughs> then, of course, I can take the two to be a, my, uh, <coughs> let me make V3 to be this. And let me make, and then I still have a little bit of freedom. I can rescale this axis and this axis, and the two, they'll still remain axis. They would not change this. But rescaling them, I can make this to have slope 1. And so the line V2 to have slope 1. In other words, by changing the basis, I can have V1 have slope 0. So V2 has slope 1. And this, what's the slope of the vertical line? Well, <coughs> so it's because the best way to talk about this is actually talking about points in a projective um, 
track or on in a projective line. But once I did that, once I had chose used my, I claimed that there, I have used up for all my freedom of choice. So there is no nothing more I can do. I can uh, so after that I have no control over where before will go. It will go to some like the slope lambda. And I cannot change that by choosing changing the basis. So if I have four point, four lines in two-dimensional space, ordered four lines, then I actually have an invariant of this quadruple of lines. Uh, and this invariant is exactly the slope of the fourth line. If I make change, send the first one, if I fix where my change of basis sends this three, or rather what slope I get for this three, then the slope of the fourth line I get is an invariant. <coughs> this invariant is called the cross ratio. And you can write it in terms of the original slopes, which again is nice, but beyond my point. But what it shows is that, in fact, in this case, we no longer have a finite configuration. We have actually a configuration uh, which has one parameter. So one para So you have a one parameter family of such indecomposable blocks, namely the one shown here. So. You might ask, so you might ask, are there other indecomposable blocks in addition to, to this one? And in this case, unfortunately, analysis is much harder than in the previous one. But um, <coughs> the answer is that <coughs> remarkably, you can, uh, but you can actually get to the full answer. Let me make right here a claim. <coughs> If you change the order of the sub uh, subspaces, right? Yeah. Does lambda change? Yes, it change, but it change in a, in a, uh, under rather simple transformation, such as one, lambda goes to one over lambda, or one over one, one over one minus lambda. So there are six possibilities you can get. Uh, so, you, but still, uh, you still have a continuous parameter, no matter what you do. But lambda does change if you change the order. So it's an invariant cross ratio is an invariant of an order uh, quadruple. And if you change the order, it changes in a very predictable and easy way. OK. So again, if you try to list the simplest possible configuration, the indecomposable one, which can be split into direct sum, so uh, it turns out that for some dimensions of the, for some choice of dimension of these vector spaces, like here, the choice of dimension was two-dimensional in the middle, and each of these being one-dimensional. For some of these choices of dimensions, you have one parameter family of decompos indecomposable blocks, and then you add them together to get. A, to get any configuration, you take direct sum of this. So in general, you would have, if you don't look just at the composable, but in all possible configurations, you have sometimes many parameter families. 
But I'm really worried about the indecomposable, the simplest blocks. And the answer is that then you can have at most one parameter tag. You never get two parameter tag. Yes. So is the number of indecomposable blocks which have uh, this one yes. this continuous parameter actually finite? Uh, so in which dimension it happens? No, 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 I'm asking what is the number of indecomposable, like what is the number of infinite families? So one, okay, so, uh, so, the, in, so they happen when, uh, when you have dimension like this, n through n, 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 n. In this situation you have one dimensional, sorry, one parameter family of decomposable blocks for every n. Except the one and it's no. got in the composable for every <coughs> yes. yes. Okay. But I, I'm not ready to explain how to construct it. Okay, so here is a very deep situation, it's more difficult, but in fact there is an explicit, even though I'm not ready to describe them, there is a rather explicit way of constructing them, so the situation is no longer fine, and you don't have fine at the main possibilities, but it's still under control. So, and just to give you a taste of what could happen, by the way, what time am I supposed to end? We started a little later, so what's the end time of the talk? So what's the expected? Um, yeah, 8 or 5. Okay, okay. Um, okay. Um, <coughs> what happens if I take 5? <coughs> Some spaces. explain how the deal would, it would require quite quite a long time, so let me just give you the answer. So the answer for the situation, oh, that's a simple answer, that it's a wild situation. That's official mathematical terminology. Um, so, there, so, the previous, so this one is stable, and this one is final. So what exactly I mean by pi? Um, there are many ways to explain what it means. In particular, one obvious, one obvious thing I could tell you right now, in this case, uh, is, so one thing I can say that in some dimensions, You get uh, My claim was that in some dimension, so you have, so if you look at what are the decomposable blocks, the building pieces of all our configuration, then the statement was that in some dimension you actually have one parameter family of such blocks. Here, situation is worse. Sometimes you can you can choose, you can find dimensions to put in all these places, so that you actually have um, in this dimension you have multi-parameter family of in decomposable blocks, and there is no upper bound on how many parameters you might need. So in some dimensions you might need 31, par you meet a 31 parameter family of decomposable blocks. So the dimensions of the, so the number of parameters is not bounded above. Which, 
let me tell you in plain words what it means. It means it's, that there is no hope ever of getting any reasonable classification. That's not a mathematical statement, that, but that's what, how you should think about that. So, which means that if, while for small dimensions, like if I say that each of these is two-dimensional, that's three-dimensional, there is a way of answering the question, but there is no hope of getting a description, which kind of uniform description, which would work for all dimensions, like we have here. So that's really, uh, so that's, uh, so that's the hopeless case, yes. So is there an upper bound on how many parameters you may need uh, at any given dimension? At given dimension. Yes. yes. So does there it go is exponential or um, uh, no now just one second. Is it exponential? No, it's not. I don't know. I, I don't think it's been an exponential, it's pretty not no. But it's still that, yes. Can you give an example when we have this bad behavior? When we have what? Like this really bad behavior. <sighs> I mean, I can give you examples where you have two-dimensional family. I can give you a dimension where you have three-dimensional family. That's two-dimensional family is very easy to do. If you put here C2 and each of these being one-dimensional, then you already have two-dimensional family. We was 31 dimensional family. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I can have prepared that, but um, uh, so let, so let me, I'm pretty sure that if you put n, and here would be, a, uh, say, 2n, n, 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 and n, and if you ask how many indecomposable blocks of this dimension there are, then the answer will be that it grows polynomially with n, and while I don't, cannot write you explicit formula, uh, uh, it's certainly easy to, take n large enough and you get as many parameters as you want. I, there is actually a pretty precise bound on that, which is, requires the understanding of theory of root system for um, hyperbolic root systems, which I'm not for where I want to go now. Okay, so remarkably, all of this actually was studied relatively recently. So let me give you a couple of, well, so I was so far talking about subspaces in adapter space. But of course you can ask many other questions of the same sort. Elementary, so after all, what do we have? We have a bunch of adapter spaces. We have a bunch of maps between them, which so far I assume to be injective, so that's embedded, but it's not really necessary. Uh, I might consider any maps. All I need to know is how they arrange, so which vector spaces are mapped into each. So, I could ask, for example, this situation. For a vector space, you have another vector space, and you have two maps, with two linear maps between them. That's also a classification problem. So you have a pair of linear maps between two vector spaces. Can you classify them up to a change of base, and up to a choice of bases in here and here? That's actually an interesting classical problem. Going back to Kronecker in uh, late eight, uh, 19th century, who gave the full answer, but it's not an easy problem. It's significantly harder than classifying um, a linear operator in a single vector space. By the way, what's linear operator in a vector space? You can also describe by a picture like that. So you have B, you have an arrow. Each arrow indicates a linear map. So here is a linear map from V to B. So this picture just gives you a classification problem. Can you construct all pairs consisting, describe all pairs consisting of a vector space in the linear map up to choice of, um, up to change of basis in B? Or I can consider more complicated pictures like This picture is a directed graph, so you have vertices and you have arcs, but arcs are directed. Uh, so every such, and 
better way or produces a quiver. So quiver is nothing but a direct collection of points, vertices of the, of the quiver connected by directed, directed arcs. That's it. So every such quiver gives you some classification problem. Namely, you put a vector space at every vertex, you put a linear map at every, uh, on every edge, and you ask to classify them up to change of basis in each of these spaces. So that's a classification problem. That's a classification problem. These quivers were deleted properly. So they, by the way, how many of you are not know what's the answer to this one? What's the complete classification for linear maps from um, vector space to itself? You wrote it down. Hmm? You wrote it down. Well, I wrote down the name, but still there is a formula that goes with the name. So the answer is that it is so-called Jordan canonical form. So there, are, so everything is built out of blocks which look like this. Of course, for diagonalizable operators, life is easy. But the whole point is that the operators don't have to be diagonalizable. So again, you see that here, for various dimensions, you have one parameter family. Or you can consider this quiver. OK. Uh, what would be the classification problem here? I'm not asking what the answer is, but what the question is in terms of linear vector spaces, linear maps, and all that. So you have, so what you need to do, again, you, you put a vector space here, you put a linear map on each arrow. So we are talking about beta consisting of a vector space and A and two linear operators from P to N, and you're asking, can you classify such a data up to change of basis? That's a classical problem of linear algebra. <coughs> Uh, simultaneous classification of pair of matrices up to a conjugation. Uh, how many of you know the answer to that one? Okay. No. Not surprisingly, I don't know either. <laughs> to be precise, that's again an example of a problem of, of a wild problem. Meaning that if you start, so in here we have very easy to describe in decomposable blocks and everything was built out of them. Here, if you start doing that, then um, the number of indecomposable blocks you can get in decomposable situation grows with the dimension of V, and uh, there is no uniform description. So that's usually, so that's problem which for all practical purposes doesn't admit a reasonable answer, which if I had more time, I could probably give to you. Uh, in a slightly better way, uh, but the saying that you have arbitrary many parameters is good enough probably. And in fact, so there is so there is a theorem which go which I'm going to give you. Remarkably, as I said, you don't really need any, any uh, tools to define this problem, but you do need tools to study them. composable integration, one which cannot be written as direct sum. Uh, so.
turns out that everything which does not fall into one of these two classes is at least as difficult as classifying So it turns out that if you have any quiver which is not of this type, which is not of this type, then it is as difficult, at least as difficult as this one to be precise. If you if you have any quiver which is not of these two types, then classifying its representation would oh, sorry, classifying the corresponding um, configuration of vector spaces, which of course the proper name for it is representation of the quiver. So the, that problem would be would include as a as a sub problem classifying all configuration like this, which as I said is essentially considered to be yeah, uh, uh, impossible, at yeah. least in any uniform way. That's also grow for numbers, like Yeah, they also grow in the, yes, so you have arbitrary number of them. Yes. Why do you isolate the one parameter case here? And instead of like looking at just, you know, maybe just two parameter, like n It's not high isolate, that's the real world isolate. It turns out that there is no situation where you have at most two parameter family. If you have at least two parameter family, uh, of decomposable lo blocks in one place, then you actually have all the all. So then uh, you have all dimensions. Any any number of dimensions becomes possible. So you cannot stay. You either stay at, at most one, or you get any possible number of parameters. It's not the choice I make. It's the way life works. Yeah. So if you take if you look at this Jordan uh, Quiver. And actually, it has a funny property that you do have these other blocks, but actually there is a dense subset of matrices where you, which I said, uh, they are normalized, right? So I asked, yeah. this other, right? Yeah. You have for generic matrix, you can actually they are it. So, what about two matrices or these other things? If I take something which is generic rather than completely general, is it the life easier? Or? Yeah, but that's the whole problem. So, you it's. You can write an invariant which kind of classifies matrix pairs of matrices in generic position. But then you ask what is non-generic position. And then you say, okay, in a non-generic position, some eigenvalues are equal or things like that. And then you need to introduce additional invariants which tell you how to distinguish these cases. And as dimension grows, the number of these additional invariants grows. You cannot give a uniform answer. So it's... Uh, you could try and do that. There are papers where this is done, but that's never ending process. So it's, you have to go deeper and deeper into more and more degenerate cases if dimension grows. That's not something I want to do. So let me, since I have about five minutes, and I also promised to tell you a little bit more. So let me, um, let me also give you, so it would be nice if we not only could say this, but also could tell what, so uh, for which exact quivers we have each of these possibilities. Okay. I'll tell you. So what I, so what I mean by finite type, again I mean that there are only finitely many possible blocks out of which any configuration is built. And it turns out that we can actually get a full list of that.
explicit answer. You might ask why I call it A, T, and P. Well, the answer is that that's actually part of like the larger classification, and there are letters A, B, C, which uses letters A, B, C, D, E, E, F, G, and the letters are chosen just because whatever letters are in the shop. There's no special meaning. Okay. Uh, that's a very remarkable result. So it turns out that this question of classifying representations, uh, classifying this configuration of vector spaces, is, can be explicitly resolved. And um, another interesting feature here is that this actually doesn't depend on which direction you put on arrows. I could put direct arrows like, uh, like this, or I, can, or I can arrogate them in the same way, and then the, con the configuration, the classification would change. I would have different blocks. But the question whether it's a finite type or not, whether there are only finite many possibilities or not, doesn't. And that's not clear at all. Um, so, this, so in particular, what are the questions which we uh, so in particular, the question about two subspace. So this, so, so question about two, a subspace in a vector space is this picture, two vertices, one edge. Question about two subspaces in in a vector space is this one. That's a three. Index is always the number of vertices. And question about three subspaces. Is this one. And that's where it ends. If you add four subspaces, it still is a nice diagram, it's still a quiver, but it's not on this list. Okay. And of course, I've spent a lot more time than I wanted on preliminaries. So let me finish by saying this. So this kind of diagrams appear in very many classification problems. Uh, so, so they appear in the theory of Lie algebras, and that's probably the most famous example. They appear in the theory in classification of singularities in um, uh, so of smooth maps. But there is so they appear in huge number of places. A lot of classification problems, the answer is that if you want a simple answer, then it should be a diagram of this sort, which are called ADE linked diagrams. But let me tell you one example which doesn't require much to explain, at least to give you the statement. Uh, it turns out that the same diagrams also classify different things. Namely, they also classify finite subgroups in SU4 and which is almost the same as S of P. Let me ignore the difference. The reason today these two groups are not the same, but they are very closely related. Uh, so S of P is, of course, as you know, just all rotations of three-dimensional space. And um, so you can actually describe the same diagrams as ca corresponding to finite subgroups in SO3. Uh, and in fact, you can, for example, if you look, for example, if you have platonic solid, that is to say regular polytope in R3, you all know what regular polytope is or what is platonic solid. If you don't, well, there is, um, go to Simon Center. On the wall there, they have engraving of all the platonic solids. Uh, there are, as you probably know, exactly five of them. So there is a cube, uh, tetra, so there is tetrahedron, octahedron, cube, isosahedron, and dodecahedron. And each of them, each of them gives you a finite subgroup. Namely, if you have a uh, regular polytope, if you have a platonic solid, you, have the, you can take all symmetries of that solid inside uh, a group, as, so all symmetries of all rotations of that in, uh, in 
R3, and you get some group. The group depends on what polytope you took on the solid. So you have, in particular, every platonic solid gives you finite subgroups. And in fact, that's effectively all finite subgroups. If you stretch things a little bit, if you consider, say, flat polygon also as a solid, and you allow symmetries, rotational symmetries of this flat polygon, flat n gone in three dimension, that's also give you finite subgroups in SU. So that's effectively all finite subgroups. Okay. Now, can you make a guess what corresponds? So let me draw that. That you have Q. And I won't attempt to draw a bit of So, uh, So I claim that, in fact, there is a way to construct this arrow, which I hope to discuss, but unfortunately I ran out of time. And, but I can give you the final answer. But this, <coughs> if you look at the symmetries of this platonic solid, it's actually described by the corresponding climate subgroup in SO3. It is the one which corresponds to the diagram of this one, to T6. The cube corresponds to E7. Uh, what's so what corresponds to E8? Okay. Uh, what about what about dodecahedra? Where would it fit? Here. Hmm? Here. No. No order. No. Also E8? Yeah. You see icosahedron and dodecahedron. They are not the same platonic solids, but they actually, one of them is dual to each other in the sense that if you take the centers of the faces of one, they are exactly the vertices of the other and vice versa. So they share the same group of symmetries. Similar picture is between the cube and octahedra. If you take centers of the faces of the cube and connect them, you get octahedra. So it shows that these two platonic solids, they're different solids, but they have the same group of symmetries. So, so cube and octahedra both correspond to this one. So, but if you, now the really interesting question is, of course, how exactly you relate finite sub, so you, you can describe, you can give a full list of them that has been known for quite a while. You can explain that each of them corresponds to this one, but the really interesting question is how you would explicitly construct the correspondence between this problem and the problem of classifying configuration of vector spaces of finite type. So is there a way of actually going directly from one classification problem to the other without going <coughs> for the fact that both of them have the answer which is indexed by the same set? And that's a good question, but I'm afraid I ran out of time. So let me stop here. subgroup in SU2, of course, it acts on P1, on projective space. And therefore, you can look at various geometric uh, things related to P1, such as shifts uh, on the feature invariant under the action of that group. And it turns out that that question, that category of such shifts, can be related to the question here. But that's really a high, really fancy answer. Let me give you a somewhat simpler answer. You can actually, um, so you can actually establish the relation. Uh, so let me, so let me, now actually I think that to the answer you, the question you asked, I cannot really give a short and good answer. What I can do is I can kind of explain how this correspondence works. So that's probably good enough. So 
this correspondence works as follows. Actually, maybe I do have time to present the picture. So you can notice that every each of these graphs, you can actually looks like a star with three branches. So you have a central vertex, and you have three branches going from them. Well, this one. Here you can think that you have two branches. Choose any point, and from this you go any vertex, and from this you have two branches going up. Here you have three, and here you also have three. So all of them are the form. So let me say that this is p vertices here, this is q vertices here, and r here. I'm including when I'm counting the length. I'm including, I'm including actually the central central vertex. So, for example, here it would be, a, it would be 3, 3, and 2. So the point is that So, I claim that That's one statement, and the other statement is that I can actually explain how these three numbers, pq and r, which are lengths of these branches, are related to geometry of the corresponding polytope. Or maybe for that I would really need a picture. So uh, on a sphere consisting of regular polygons on the sphere. Regular in the sense that they are four. So the, the image is somewhat distorted, so it doesn't look like a perfect sphere, but too late to change that. So, uh, so here, uh, what I did, so, so for example, if you take a icosahedron, here you see this. This is one of the pentagons forming the icosahedron. The 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 sorry, yeah. Actually, both, both are true. So you can also, so this is one of the triangles forming icosahedron. So what I did is I took such, I took such, uh, I projected my regular platonic solid on a, uh, on a sphere, and then I marked the centers of the faces, the vertices, of course, and the midpoints of each edge, and connected them. So. And the whole picture is split into triangles. So let's look at, so again, this is one of the faces. Uh, yeah. Sorry, it should be a pentagon. Mm -hmm. Where, yeah. And so this is the center of the face, that's the center of the, of the edge, the midpoint of the edge. So you have triangles. And uh, in your, group, in your group of symmetries, you have rather obvious symmetries. You have rotation around the center of a face. Face. By some angle. rotation around vertex and then finally we have rotation around center of edge 
by n go to pi over 2. So you can rotate the whole picture by rotating by n go pi around this point. Or by n go pi over uh, 2 pi over 5 around this point or whatever. And they claim that these numbers speak u and r. I exact so the way you get this graph is from here. So you take these three numbers, which give you the angles at these three points. So angle around the, earth, uh, the center of the face, which is of course just the number of uh, sides of each face, then vertices, and then the number, and then the edge, and that gives you numbers p, q, and r, which enter here. And this inequality actually comes from the simple observation that if you have a spherical triangle, then the sum of the angles of this spherical triangle should be greater than 1. And in fact, the, uh, this excess can be expressed in terms of the area of spherical triangle. So that explains why this inequality is necessary. It doesn't quite explain why it is sufficient. Okay, I think I really have to stop now. Uh, but there is a lot of nice, interesting connection in these pictures which are worth exploring. Some of them require very high-tech machinery, but others are completely elementary. So, so you, the group of symmetries of these pictures can, is generated by these three rotations around this point, around this point, and around this point. Each of them has the order P, Q, and R respectively. And that's the description of the group. And these numbers also enter in this diagram. Yeah. Is there a similar story about four-dimensional regular polyhedron? No, their life is much more complicated, unfortunately. Yeah. So there is a classification of subgroups in SO4, of finite subgroups, but you cannot really easily relate it to thinking diagrams or anything else. Okay. OK. So in this way, Three dimensions seems to be really special. Okay, let's start the speaker.